Okay, we're going to get started. There'll be a few people trickling in, I'm sure, um, but we have a full program this afternoon, so uh, I'd like to get going. My name is Christian Osterman. Uh, I direct the History and Public Policy Program here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholar, and I very much like to welcome you to the center. The Wilson Center, for all of those of you who are here for the first time or who may be watching us um, uh, on the broadcast, the center is the official U.S. memorial to Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, as both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a PhD, and a national leader, Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were in, engaged in a common enterprise. Here at the Wilson Center, we commemorate the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson by providing a link between the world of ideas and the world of policy by fostering research, study, discussion, and collaboration among a full spectrum of individuals concerned with policy and scholarship in national and world affairs. Directed by former Congressman Lee Hamilton, the center hosts about 150 to 200 scholars annually and holds over 400 meetings on international and national affairs. The center's history and public policy program seeks to provide historical context to, to current public policy issues, as well as a forum for the discussion of new, significant, and policy-relevant historical findings and publications. Many of you are familiar with our Cold War International History Project, a leading clearinghouse, archival historical clearinghouse, in particular for new evidence on the Cold War period. Less well known is our North Korea International Documentation Project, NKIDP, uh, launched last year with a grant from the Korea Foundation as an informational clearinghouse on North Korea for both scholarly and, policymaking and the policymaking communities. The aim of the North Korea International Documentation Project, which is part of the History and Pol Public Policy Program here, is to disseminate newly declassified documents and information from archives and repositories around the world on the DPRK. Documents that provide valuable insight into the actions and the nature of the North Korean state. More information on this program um, you'll find on our website, wilsoncenter.org. You'll go to programs and, and the scroll down menu and you'll find both the Cold War International History Project and the North Korea International Documentation Project. Before I introduce our distinguished speakers, let me say a couple of words of thanks. This meeting is co-sponsored by the Center's Asia Program, directed by Dr. Robert Hathaway. Thanks also to Mark Moore, um, the Asia Program's senior associate, um, the colleague here who works on Korea with us a lot. Let me also thank my staff, in particular James Person, the coordinator of the NKIDP, who I think is watching us via webcast from Seoul, as well as my colleague Ryan Gage and our talented, re talented research assistant Sung Lee from Syracuse University, who we have the pleasure of having with us this summer. Let me also talk for a moment about uh, something that's very much of a concern to all of us here at the Wilson Center. That is the fate of our dear colleague, Dr. Halle Esfandiari, the director of the Center's Middle East program. As you may know, Halle has been imprisoned in Iran since May 8th um, at the notorious Evan Prison. She has not had contact with the outside world for this past month, except for a few one or two minute phone calls. Iranian media reports indicate that she has been charged with espionage against Iran and for involvement in efforts to topple the regime. According to an Iranian spokesman, the Ministry of Intelligence is the complainant in the case. 
We know nothing further about the state of the charges, only what's been reported in the media most recently um, through a, a propaganda film aired by Iranian TV. What we do know is that these claims are preposterous and have ignited outrage worldwide. Halle is internationally regarded as a leading scholar on Middle East affairs. She has always been an advocate for increased dialogue between the West and Iran. The work that she has done here as director of the Center's Middle East program is publicly available on our website. It honors the Center's commitment to impartiality, open scholarship, and free expression. As you can all imagine, all of us here at the Center are greatly distressed by what has happened to Halle and worried about her well-being. I urge you to lend your voice to the many worldwide who are calling upon the Iranian government to release Halle. For more information, please go either to the Wilson Center's website or to a, a website um, called freehale.org, freehale.org. Let me now introduce our distinguished panel. Today's events um, bring to light new evidence and finding, findings on a crucial period for the Korean Peninsula. And the events we will discuss today ended in many ways the zero-sum gain of mutual antagonism that char characterized Seoul-Pyongyang relations since the time of the Korean War. The July 1972 communique led to the first establishment of official contact between Seoul and Pyongyang. Although the subsequent development of the relationship has not proceeded as smoothly as many had hoped, the two countries have come a long way, even uh, being simultaneously brought into the UN in 1992. In this sense, the history we're talking about here today is an important prelude to the most recent events on the peninsula, culminating, as many of you know, in the resumption of the six-party talks on the DPRK's nuclear program in recent days. We have four um, eminent scholars here today with us to discuss both the history and its relevance, and let me introduce them Briefly, in turn, there are biographical sheets outside with more information, so I'll be real brief. Uh, the two main speakers will speak for about 15 minutes, then we'll have comments for 10 minutes each, and hopefully a couple minutes for discussion. Our first speaker is Dr. Bernd Schäfer, who is a, a senior scholar with the Center's History and Public Policy Program. Most recently, he completed a uh, five-year stint at the German Historical Institute here in Washington and has published on, uh, broadly on international history and German history, including books on American detente and German Ostpolitik, on the um, state and the Catholic Church in East Germany. Um, his current research is on American triangular diplomacy towards the USSR and China, 1969 to 1976. Um, it's with this warm welcome that I'll give Bernd the floor. Bernd. Yeah, th thank you very much, Christian, for this nice introduction, and thank you and James Person for organizing this event, and since our time is indeed very tight, I will just start right away. I will talk about North Korean positions and actions in the years between 1971 and 1975 towards the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, and I called my talk China's Coat Tales and North Korean Overconfidence, Pyongyang's Unification Drive between 71 and 75. My talk is based on the open archives of the former German Democratic Republic, GDR, East Germany, which are accessible for the research communities in uh, quite a while. Uh, these files uh, contain not only the perspectives of East Germany, but also of the comparatively well-informed Soviet Union in terms of North Korea. And since the uh, Soviet Union and the GDR were pretty close, those files give a lot of insights and information from uh, the Soviet perspective. Uh, Soviet and Eastern European diplomats in Pyongyang were, of course, aware that North Korean officials were not completely open and frank, and they provided only guarded information. But nonetheless, those files uh, of, of the East German archives hold many, many internal insights on North Korean positions and actions. For the period concerned, we are talking about, of course, uh, the most important documents uh, would not be 
in East Germany or even the Soviet Union, but uh, in North Korea proper, of course, and in China, because China was at that time certainly North Korea's most important partner and closest ally. But as we all know, the archives in China on these topics at this period are not open, and they are not open in North Korea as well, as we all know. Now let me talk about 1971 to 75, because this is really an interesting period in North Korean uh, history. Uh, North Korea had a rapprochement with uh, China after some very tense period between in the, during the Cultural Revolution, and this rapprochement started in uh, 1970 already. And China certainly, as we can gather from the documents, informed North Korea about its on going first tentative talks with the United States. It didn't come as a real surprise when in 1971 the Chinese-American rapprochement came about in North Korea. Only the circumstances, Kissinger's visit and the announcement of the Nixon upcoming Nixon visit to China were not known in detail, but I think the major framework was known to North Korea. This showed in some initiatives which in 71 first in April, the Supreme People's Assembly of the DPRK, North Korea, started. And then, after the announcement of the Nixon visit, uh, Kim Il-sung in person in August 1971, when he announced uh, the start of Red Cross talks between North and uh, South Korea. The archival information uh, we have based on the talks, which the Eastern European diplomats had with North Korean officials, basically uh, had two major uh, reasons for those North Korean shift towards some sort of rapprochement with uh, South Korea and bringing about reunification in peaceful terms, which was a major deviation from the very militant viewpoint of North Korea towards the reunification of the Korean Peninsula uh, it held in the late 1960s. Those two main reasons, according to the East German Eastern European diplomats, were first of all, the North Koreans thought that the rapprochement between the United States and China is a great chance to get the Americans completely out of the peninsula. Because the Americans might leave Taiwan, as that's what the North Koreans gathered from, from the Chinese. And in particular, the, the rapprochement between the United States and China really does not require any more American troop presence in South Korea. In May 1972, Kim Il-sung gave an interview to the New York Times, a very rare event. In this e interview, he clearly stated there is no longer any need for American troop presence in South Korea because uh, America now has good relations with Moscow as well as uh, Beijing, so there's no reason to protect the South Korean regime from communism. And the other major point which the Eastern diplomats noted is that, and this is the internal insight, that South Korea is developing rapidly in economic terms and might surpass uh, North Korea by significant extent due to its close ties with Japan. And if North Korea doesn't start at this point to have some reunification drive, then the South might be way too far ahead and reunification might become more uh, difficult. In 1972, Kim Il-sung clearly indicated that he was willing that his regime was talking to the South Korean regime. And there was a lot of secret talks going on, which finally reached the very high level when the uh, South Korean intelligence chief, Lee Hurak, uh, came to Pyongyang and had talks with Kim Il-sung. And those talks prepared the famous so-called joint declaration of South and North of 4th of July 1972, when both North Korea and South Korea, they of course have chosen the 4th of July, the American uh, holiday, for an announcement that uh, both uh, states should come together on peaceful, by peaceful means, building one unified nation regardless of ideological and social differences and without any foreign interference. This declaration was followed by a lot of bilateral meetings. I don't want to go into those uh, details. But what we know from those archives I was talking about previously is that the North Koreans thought this would be a great chance to reunify the peninsula on North Korean terms. And they thought they had clearly the upper hand. Uh, they wanted to, to, to make sure that South Korea gets doesn't get any support from the American side anymore, that it has completely to rely on North Korea, and in this process, North Korea would just overpower South Korea uh, by its own strength. 
uh, North Korea opted for uh, the uh, free opted for free elections on the peninsula and was absolutely convinced that it would win a lopsided victory because uh, the vast majority of the South Koreans would be either poor and wanted to improve their plight or they would be in opposition to the uh, Park Chung-hee uh, government and would vote for, for North Korea. And they also thought, and uh, there are a lot of reports on that, when South Korean delegates came to North Korea in the uh, wake of those uh, bilateral talks, that they would notice the northern superiority all across uh, the board. Very important for the North Koreans was to, to, to tell their allies, their communist allies, that this actually does not mean that North Korea wants to give up its communist socialist model. They made a lot of internal statements that North Korea will never give up socialist system, class-based ideological positions and Marxism-Leninism, but just for tactical reasons, they have to talk about some sort of confedera election, confederation, and unification first before the entire Korean peninsula would become a socialist state modeled after uh, North, North Korea. Well, as we all know, this did not work out for, for various reasons. Uh, we will hear this, I think, in the second talk to much more detail. In uh, South Korea, uh, the leader of the president, Park Chung-hee, declared martial law and emergency rule on 17th of October 1972. Uh, this was actually quite interesting then that the South Koreans informed the North Koreans beforehand uh, about that. And North Korea actually held back uh, its public propaganda on this issue for a while before it ultimately uh, con con condemned it. The South Korean strategy, of course, of the regime in South Korea was that they wanted to, to make sure that any opposition to the regime in the South would not play into the hands uh, of the North. Um, the North was basically convinced uh, still that even with martial law in force and the population the South subdued, that there's still a major chance to achieve unification on North Korean terms. They, even, they, they termed it in sort of soccer results, being, basically saying the score is now one to one because Park Chung-hee in the South has eliminated, sort of for temporarily eliminated the, the, the opposition, uh, but there's still a very good chance that we win. And without, and this is in the files, the North Koreans said, without the declaration of martial law in the South, the score would have been clearly two to one in favor of the North because North Korea would overwhelmingly, of course, vote for the leader, and South Korean population would, uh, would go for the North Korean position as well, and there's only the Park Chung-hee regime which is in the way uh, of this, uh, of this uh, development. Interestingly, North Korea tried again after they, they realized that the uh, things in the South were not developing as they hoped, that in November 1972 in Pyongyang there, came, there was a second direct meeting between North Korean leader Kim Il-sung and, and Lee Hurak, the South Korean intelligence chief. And there Kim Il-sung made a lot of proposals how to have the two uh, parts of the uh, peninsula coming closer together. He came up with many proposals on joint trade, joint fishing, common irrigation projects, a joint purification of Korean language from Japanese and American words, uh, joint historical research and, and a lot of other things. And he expressed to the Soviet ambassador uh, a few days later, if the South Korean population would only know about those proposals made by the North Korean side, they would immediately overthrow the dictatorship. But unfortunately, the dictatorship in South Korea is withholding uh, this information. The North Korean, the official North Korean uh, position was uh, to build an immediate confederation under the name Federal Republic of Koryo, governed by one Supreme National Council with representatives from, from both states. But ultimately, uh, the constitution in the South and the political situation in the South did not play along with those uh, North Korean uh, ideas. And when the uh, South Korean leader Park Chung-hee declared emergency and made himself president of South Korea, North Korea followed in December 72, with Kim Il-sung now also assuming the title of president. Uh, he was prime minister uh, be beforehand. In 73, the North Korean statements clearly say that they think that Park Chung-hee in the South will be no partner whatsoever in this enterprise to unify the peninsula in a peaceful way. The only way to and now they return to previous positions. The only chance to reunify the peninsula would be to influence the opposition parties in the South 
which were working towards some regime change in Seoul to unmask, uh, as they called it, uh, South Korea in public before the entire world, and this would finally lead somehow to peaceful unification uh, of, of, of Korea. And the DPRK, of course, uh, also made a lot of other steps. We will hear about this later, I guess, which uh, clearly indicated they were back to more militant measures. They, they planned the assassination of the South Korean president. This must have been started around 72 when those other talks supposedly uh, went sour, and there was this assassination attempt on South Korean President Park Chung-hee on 21st of September 74, which killed his wife, but this had been in the making for at least uh, two years. They were building a lot of tunnels under the DMC. I think we also hear about, about that. We can basically say by 1975, Kim Il-sung seemed to have returned to his positions from the late 60s, namely military liberation of Korea following staged turmoil in the South. And here he was clearing clearly drawing inspiration from what happened in April 75 in Cambodia and Vietnam. He didn't want North Korea to fall too much behind those South Asian communist states. He went to China in 75, and we don't know so much about this meeting, but clearly at this meeting, Kim, which Kim Il-sung had with the Chinese leaders, including with Mao, was really whether North Korea would uh, actually rely, resort to military action in South Korea. Apparently, the Chinese advised against it, but it was another point where confrontation actually was close uh, over South Korea. To sum it up, we can at least say that this unification drive brought from the terms looking at the North Korean situation an international recognition of North Korea on a so far unprecedented sale, uh, scale. Uh, over 90 states worldwide had recognized North Korea by the mid-1970s, and this almost equaled the number of diplomatic recognitions of South Korea. The United Nations Commission for the Unification and Reconciliation of Korea, UNCORG, uh, was uh, it dissolved. It was a remnant of the Korean War, of course. The DPRK also secured memberships in the WHO and established observer missions with the United Nations in New York uh, uh, and Geneva. The last word should be with the, uh, with the East German and, uh, and, and Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, diplomats and, and their files, because they have a very interesting uh, quote again from, from Kim Il-sung, just outlining uh, the North Korean strategy when they were optimistic, overconfident about unification. Uh, Kim Il-sung was actually comparing uh, his own state, North Korea, with white and South Korea with red. And he was saying white, on, he was saying this privately to the Soviet ambassador, white on red is easy, but red on white is much more difficult. The Soviet uh, diplomats certainly thought from, from that that uh, Kim Il-sung was completely over-optimistic, overconfident that he might sell out the socialist store. And what we can see from all those files, there was quite some relief in the Soviet Union and with his allies when this Korean unification drive finally failed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernd. Our next, our next speaker is Professor Myung Won No from Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Um, Professor No studied at Hankook University, uh, later on uh, at Münster University in Germany, and received his PhD from Essen University, where he studied with uh, Wilfried Loth. Uh, he has a number of publications to his credit, including the question of European Monetary Union and its implications for world history, and West Integration versus Osthandel, West Integration versus Eastern Trade. And he's also published a history of European unification. Bernd has uh, uh, in many ways taken the lead on internationally on exploiting the East German archives for the purpose of new information on North Korea and other subjects. Um, I believe Professor No will uh, also be talking about this, but also the West German archives um, bring those into the equation. You've got the floor. Thank you very much. Dr. Ostman, for your kind introduction. Uh, the, uh, the South Korean unification policy on the basis of West uh, German archival materials, 1969-74, is the title of my today's presentation. 
Uh, the embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, the abbreviation for that FRG, namely the West Germany, collected, inspected, and reviewed information regarding Korean South North relations with diligence and caution, especially during the years 1969-74. This, this is the period of Ost politics for West Germany. The embassy reported this information very promptly to the West German Foreign Ministry in Bonn, where it was given immediate attention by the headquarters of the foreign services. These documents are preserved in the political archives of the Foreign Office of the Federal Republic of Germany. These documents throw invaluable Light on the historical research into West German Ost politics and the Korean South North relations between 1969 and 74. I will review the quantity and the main contents of these documents. This work will show us the degree and the directions of the West German interest to the Korean South North relations and South Korean South North relations themselves. In 1969, the Republic of Korea established the National Unification Board. It exchanged as much information as possible with the ministries of the Federal Republic of Germany that dealt with inter-German relations and foreign affairs. The West German institutions were also keen on working with their South Korean counterparts because they believed that such contact would widen their horizons. Both sides appreciated the fact that this mutual cooperation would deepen the bonds between the two countries. The West German embassy in Seoul carefully reviewed the personnel and the policies of the National Unification Board and the Foreign Ministry. According to the West German Embassy in Seoul, the United States exerted great influence on South Korea's policies. By the end of the 1960s, Washington strongly recommended that the Seoul government should begin peaceful exchanges with North Korea based on the model of West and East Germany. The reasons for this U.S. initiative lay in the geopolitical conditions in East Asia. By the end of the 1960s, the U.S., the Soviet, and China all came to the common conclusion that Easing the mounting tensions on the Korean Peninsula would have to be part of an establishment of that tongue among themselves. Each party has its own interest in wanting to maintain the status quo of a divided Korea and its leverage over the balance of power in East Asia. The government of South Korea recognizing that the spirit of that tongue was developing worldwide, responded positively to the U.S. initiative. On August 15, 1970, the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the South Korean Republic, President Park Jong-hee issued a statement to the North. He invited the Pyongyang government to desist forthwith from perpetrating all sorts of military provocations. The West German Federal Ministry for inter german Relations had begun to cooperate more closely with the South Korean National Unification Board. The West German Embassy recommended that Lee Yu ha the then board Bo's vice minister should be invited to Bonn to discuss practical issues. 
the West Germany had just signed the Moscow Treaty with the Soviet Union on August 12, 1970, and officially launched its Ost policy. Thus, Li's visit to West Germany linked the two countries' efforts to overcome their division. In Bonn, Li Gyu-hak explained Park, Park Chung-hee's declaration and uh, emphasized the necessity of close cooperation between South Korea and West Germany. At every meeting, Li sought as much information as possible about Bonn's Ost politics and especially about the terms of the Moscow Agreement. It is obvious evidence that uh, South Korea uh, got much influence from Ost politics of West Germany. These West German interlocutors explained the importance of the Soviet Union for the eventual solution of the German question and clarified the con concessions they were willing to make regarding the borders with Poland and East Germany. In order to pave the way for eventual reunification, the Bonn government was prepared to grant de facto recognition to East Germany and to accept the entry of the two, Germans, two German states into the United Nations. They explained to the Korean emissary that the two Germanys would eventually should be reunited once the appro appropriate conditions were satisfied because in principle the German people belonged to one nation, a position defined by the formulation, one nation in two states. This briefing greatly impressed Li gyu Hag, who found it an instructive and meaningful lesson for South Korea's quest to initiate that tank with the North. The Bonn government's approach to solving the German question in its European context and of overcoming enormous differences of ideologies and the social systems acted as a catalyst to trying to solve the Korean question in the East Asian context. Not surprisingly, North Korea did not respond to President Park's invitation. However, on August 12, 1971, the South Korean Red Cross suddenly suggest a meeting with his North Korean counterpart proposing an agreement on the reunion of dispersed families. The West German Embassy in Seoul took a particular interest in this meeting, noting its similarity with the current West politic discussions in West Germany. The West Germans regarded the two Koreas as responding to international pressure, and in particular to the will of the great powers towards the town. They also saw the so South Koreans as emulating their strategy, even though they did not acknowledge the other side as a fully independent state. Thus, German diplomats in Seoul gave their cautious approval to the Red Cross talks. North Korea, which had rejected Park's suggestion, gave a positive response to the Red Cross proposal. Pyongyang and Seoul began actively holding intra-Korean meetings. They produced the, the epochal South-North communique. The joint communique issued on July 4, 1972, announced that both sides were now aiming for the unification of Korea. Both parties agreed not to slander or defame each other or to undertake armed provocations, to carry out various exchanges in many fields, to seek the early success of South-North Red Cross talks, 
to install direct telephone service between Seoul and Pyongyang, to establish and operate a South North Coordinating Committee to fully carry out these agreed items. The Bonn government, recognizing the fundamental changes embodied in the communique, pronounced its own important contribution to easing tensions in East Asia. And where so many confirmed that the universal value of Earth polity through uh, this event. So on August 15, 1972, Billy Brandt, West German Chancellor, in his congratulatory message to South Korean President Park Chung-hee, gave high praise to the joint communique. It was a very interesting document for me. West Germany was also aware that the two Koreas had deliberately avoided acknowledging each other as independent states. The joint communique had used the term unification of the fatherland without confirming the existence of one nation. This contrasted dramatically with the German case. The GDR's position to the use to the issue of sovereignty contrasted greatly with North Korea's. Unlike North Korea, the GDR insisted on its historical and ideal ideological distinctiveness in order to legitimize its position on independence and sovereignty. There was also a major difference between West Germany and South Korea. The Bonn government was committed to European integration based on the supranational ideas that prevailed in West Germany after the Second World War. Billy Brandt Ostpolity was a renunciation of militant nationalism and a commitment to building a united Europe for Korea. On the other hand, the driving force behind the South-North dialogue, dialogue was a traditional nationalism. Where West Germans found the concept of fatherland increasingly alien, for Koreans it was still their principal goal. It's very important difference between German case and Korean case. According to the observance of the West Germany, the United States welcomed the July 4th statement, which created a thaw in one of the most dangerous regions in the Cold War. The Bonn government observed how the Americans were drawing parallels among the three divided countries to search for a solution to the Vietnam problem. If divided Koreans and the Germans now feel the international situation permits them to reassert their common nationalism, perhaps they can set an example for the most tortured of all divided nations. Its name is Vietnam. It's a, a quotation from a uh, newspaper. Uh, this uh, quotation was preserved by South Korean uh, West German embassy in South Korea. It was also very interesting. However, neither of the two Korean governments expressed confidence in the joint communique. Indeed, immediately after the July 4th statement, each regime moved quickly to establish control and to ensure domestic solidarity against the boundaries of South-North relations. Both governments developed their own ideological logic. Their strong leadership was more than ever needed to control the unstable situation. By monopolizing the channels between the South and the North, they could manipulate the security consciousness of their respective peoples. In the South, on 17th October 1972, President Park made a surprise announcement of a new political system called Yushin. It means revitalizing reforms. In practice, this 
meant the introduction of a left of authoritarian measures. West Germany, faced with these retrogressive political events, was surprised and disappointed, believing that the Seoul government was manipulating a volatile situation. It feared that the real purpose of the July 4th communique had been to promote military dictatorship. Born immediately became skeptical about the dialogue between the South and the North. The Bonn government was less shocked by the authoritarian response in North Korea because of its already notorious dictatorial system where Kim Il-sung further bolstered his dictatorship. The Pyongyang regime renewed its efforts to disseminate its ideology to jail it means self-reliance, which won't uh, uh, present already in detail, meaning a more strongly controlled society, almost totally isolated from the outside world, but continuing to aim for the communization of the South. Under this ideology, Juche, the North heightened the, the organized personality cult surrounding Kim Il-sung. On the eve of the entry of both German states into the United Nations, Park Jong-hee suddenly proposed the entry of both Koreas into that body through his special declaration of June 23, 1973. The South Korean president denied that this step implied an acknowledgement of North Korea as a sovereign independent state and insisted it would not hamper reunification. Emulating Bourne, Park has announced his willingness to open relations with countries that maintain the ties with the North, including communist governments. This implied giving up the South Korean version of the Hallstein Doctrine. So far, Seoul had applied this West German principle in its foreign policy as a major guideline for South-North Korean relations. However, Pyongyang rejected Park's June 23rd proposal, claiming that it would perpetuate the country's division. To the surprise and the disappointment due to the negative developments in the two Koreas after the July 1st joint communique, West German diplomatic circle did not give any longer serious attention to Park's June 20th declaration. On August 8th, 1973, it was reported that Kim Dae-jung, the leader of the opposition party in South Korea, and a former presidential candidate was abducted in Japan, presumably by the, uh, by the Korean Central Intelligence Agency. Three weeks later, as an act of protest, North Korea suspended the North-South dialogue, including the political discussions and the Red Cross talks. Another dramatic incident helped to terminate the South-North discussions. On August 15, 1974, the 29th anniversary of South Korea's independence, there was an assassination attempt against Park Jong-hee by Moon se gwan who was born and raised in Japan and had been trained by the pro-North Korean organization in Japan, the Joseon. Although the president survived, his wife was killed. Three months later, on November 15, 1974, the spokesman of the UN command announced the discovery of a tunnel which had been secretly dug by the North Korean army and extended 1.2 kilometers inside the southern sector of the demilitarized zone. There was an escalation of suspicion, mistrust, and tension 
across the divide peninsula. By 1974, the year of deliverance, resignation, the dialogue between South and North had reached a dead end without a statesmanship capable of accommodating a hostile labor and eliciting great power support. The South-North dialogue in the spirit of West German Ost politics completely evaporated until South Korea moved towards democracy. Especially the optimistic but cautious sunshine policy initiated by the Kim Dae-jung administration represents a revival of the Ostpolitik model. In the long run, Bonn's Ostpolitik also made it clear that the South-North dialogue aimed at unification of Korea could be pursued only in cooperation with the relevant neighboring regional states in the Asia-Pacific geopolitical space. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll go right to our first commentator, um, Dr. Miryang Yoon. Uh, it's a bittersweet uh, uh, pleasure to and privilege to introduce Miryang who has been a public policy scholar with us here at the Wilson Center for the past year. Today is her last event at the center, her last day at the center, um, and uh, we all regret that uh, uh, she has been called back to Seoul. She serves as, has served as Deputy Director General at the Ministry of Unification uh, in Seoul. Uh, her current research focuses on North Korean women's issues, but she's also um, published widely on international cooperation strategies regarding the establishment of the peace regime on the North Korean peninsula. Miyang, um, you've got the floor. We all phenomenally enjoyed having you here and uh, look forward to your remarks. Thank you for your sweet introduction of me. Thank you. Uh, even before I leave for Korea, I already missed Woodrow Wilson Center. I learned a lot and I enjoyed tremendously being here. I thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, listening to the great presentation of two scholars, I cannot help but thinking that, oh, oh, is the German perceived that uh, Kim Il-sung had overconfidence about uh, reunification. But I think the West Germany had overconfidence of the influence of also the political over South Korean policy over North Korea. Because I think there is missing as that uh, South Korean perception of North Korea or South Korean po position towards North Korea. Uh, South Korean policy towards North Korea has been uh, formulated mainly by domestic reasons, uh, particularly uh, by the President Park's perception of um, reunification and his perception of development. I would like to emphasize two factors here because of the time limit, I will be brief. Two things, the first factor is uh, President Park's basic um, policy towards North Korea. His uh, basic policy towards North Korea was uh, uh, summarized as uh, construction first, unification next. And that, as you can see, the construction means economic development. Uh, President Park uh, believed that economic superiority would uh, conquer. He always uh, trusted to just to conquer the communists. He would not concede anything at all. Just, uh, he believed that economic uh, power would uh, uh, destroy or conquer the communists. So he believed that economic development should uh, proceed over reunification of uh, any kind. And he really uh, pushed forward the economic development. During the 1960s, South Korean economy d 
development was amazing. But North Korean economic development uh, was far amazing before South Korea even launched its economic development plan. During 1950s, North Korean economic recovery was uh, amazing, and North Korea have launched its five-year economic plan in 1957. It was, uh, uh, should, it was supposed to be completed in 1962, but it was claimed to be completed in 19, actually 1960, but they said they finished it in 1961, one year ahead of their plan. That means North Korean economic uh, rehabilitation or economic reconstruction was completed far ahead of their plan. Based on their success in uh, their five-year plan, North Korea uh, launched its seven, first seven-year economic plan in 1961, this is one year ahead of uh, their initial plan. And that seven-year economic plan uh, focused on heavily focused on uh, heavy industry, and it was rather unrealistically emphasized on heavy industry. Because of because of the amazing success during the five-year economic plan, the unrealistic uh, economic seven-year economic plan was uh, too much emphasizing on uh, heavy industry and uh, not much of uh, agriculture. As a result, uh, by the end of 1967, it was the target year of uh, that seven-year plan. The economic agricultural sector could not complete or could not reach their target goal. So North Korea had to put another three years of um, adjustment period for complete their seven-year plan. That means their first seven-year economic plan was completed in 10 years, 30 years later. While North Korean economic development was just lagged behind for a little bit, South Korean economic development was just pacing up. And South Korea first launched its five-year economic plan in 1962. During that period, first five-year plan period, uh, on average, eight. 0.5% of every annual economic growth rate was reached. And the, in 1967, uh, the second five-year plan was launched. And during the uh, second five-year plan period, South Korea reached almost 10% of annual economic growth rate. And by year uh, 1972, uh, South Korean economists uh, reported to President Park that uh, South Korea overtook, or if not surpassed, North Korea in economic terms. And economic per capita, uh, GMB per capita, has uh, overtook North Korea. Based on that economic uh, capacity, President Park was uh, ready to uh, take a peace initiative if necessary. It was his first reason to uh, to be flexible to any kind of no, situation in international. The other factor was the Nixon doctrine. Nixon doctrine was uh, to many South Korean public was the announcement of abandonment by the U.S. of South Korean people. The disengagement of Vietnam during the late uh, 60s and early 70s was already shocked to, to many South Koreans. And the Nixon, doc Nixon Doctrine was just a sort of uh, ultimatum for many South Koreans uh, to be prepared to be abandoned. In order to be abandoned or in order to be prepared for that case, uh, President Buck uh, should accommodate the international atmosphere of detente. So he was ready to take initiative for peaceful resolution of Korean Peninsula. That two factors was the most important thing uh, for President Park to take some initiative. I have a strong doubt that anything of also the politics has any influence over President Park's initiative to North Korea. But of course, President Park might learn a lot from the Oslo politics and the 
um, something international recognition of that uh, soft policy. But I believe that President Park's uh, initial intention was to uh, well, initial intention was his confidence about the economy, and another thing was be, being prepared to be abandoned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, we're very pleased that the center is um, really becoming a note for uh, visiting scholars from Korea and for research on Korea. And with that, um, let me welcome to this panel and to the Wilson Center, Professor Kilje Ryo, who is a visiting scholar with the um, North Korea International Documentation Project here at the center. And he's also an associate professor at the University of North Korean Studies in Seoul. His publications include books on the rise of the exceptional state, militarism, and the expanded role of the Korean People's Army in North Korea, published in 2001, Prospects for North Korean Transformation and the Problems of Early Unification, and Foreign Policy of North Korea after Kim Il-sung. His current research focuses on domestic politics and foreign relations of the DPRK in the Cold War era, particular for the years 1965 to 1975. Kilje, welcome to the center, and you've got the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me first express my uh, gratitude to the Wilson Center for inviting uh, me to speak at today's uh, important forum, uh, particularly to Christian for leading the NKIDP, North Korean International Documentation Project, here at the Wilson Center. Uh, let me confine, uh, as I'm researching the, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, period, late 1960s and early 1970s, so uh, my confine, uh, uh, let me confine my comments to uh, Bon Sheffer's presentation. Uh, this is quite interesting uh, presentation that sheds light on the relations between the change of international environments and the North Korea's policy towards South Korea. Uh, I was thoroughly impressed with Bon's another paper, uh, this one, the World Center's uh, uh, called the International History Project, North Korean Adventurism and China's Long Shadow 966-72. Uh, firstly, because it revealed how far the relationship between Pyongyang and Beijing was at that moment. Secondly, because it raised a new interpretation that North Korea's perceived threat from China's cultural revolution played a major role in making North Korea to take more adventurous and provocative actions against South Korea and even against the United States in the late 1960s. Likewise, I'd like to say that I could get more insights from this presentation that Pyongyang's policy towards Seoul can be understood in context of her relations with their allies, specifically with China. Probably, even if now in the post-Cold War era, the historical lesson is still very useful. Burns' researches, as he mentioned clearly, are based on the archival documents that are recently declassified mainly in Germany. While these documents can provide us with the window to examine the internal politics of the most veiled country today, they do not reveal all the truth. As Bond rightly points out, the North Korean officials gave only guarded information to the Soviet and Eastern European diplomats even in the heyday of Cold War. The documents need to be interpreted cautiously and carefully. Let me make some additional comments to supplement Bond's argument. First, to, to understand the shift in Pyongyang's adventurous policy towards Seoul in the late 1960s to the dialogue in the, in the early 1970s, we have to consider Pyongyang's reflection over the failure of adventurous provocations, mainly military infiltrations and assaults. In the late 1960s, Pyongyang expected the guerrillas 
from the north would be welcomed by the population of the south and consequently inflamed the armed struggle against the Seoul government then headed by President Park Jong-hee. Kim Shin-jo, only survivor of the infiltration team to raid the Blue House on January 21st, 1968, stated after the arrest that the guerrillas felt so confused when they recognized South Koreans' fear of their presence. Most of several hundred North Korean guerrillas that were sent to the South from 1967 to 69 were killed. The adventurism was a great failure. Second, the Nixon doctrine and the communists' advantage in the Vietnamese war also influenced Pyongyang's change in strategy towards Seoul. The Nixon doctrine reminded Kim Il-sung of the Atchison line in January 1950, and the Vietnamese war encouraged North Korea to keep the United Front strategy. Kim Il-sung really paid attention to the role of the National Front for the Liberation in South Vietnam. The third clause of Minjok Daedanggyal, uh, or Great National Unity, of the July 4th Joint Declaration was to make efforts to organize the equivalent of Vietnamese NFL in South Korea. Pyongyang recognized that dispatching guerrillas and agents to the South were no longer effective, and Pyongyang decided to return to the traditional way of United Front strategy. These two points, even if not based on documents, should be taken into consideration in examining and understanding Pyongyang's policy change in the early 1970s. And regarding China factor, let me add some historical cases. First, Kim Il-sung fought in guerrilla warfare against Japanese, Japanese imperialism in the 1930s in Manchuria. He was a member of the aligned unit of Chinese and Korean, but the unit was led by Chinese Communist Party. Second, after the Chinese volunteers joined the Korean War, again, North Korean army was led by the Chinese Communist Party. Third, when the so-called August Faction incident against Kim Il-sung took place in 1956, the leaders of anti-Kim Il-sung group were mostly consist consisted of Yan'an faction who fought in anti-Japanese war and anti-Kuomintang were along with the Chinese Communist Party members in mainland China. These historical experiences not only unified the two countries, but also gave bitter resemblances, even disgrace to Kim Il-sung, to North Korea. Whereas China has been the closest country to North Korea and played a critical role in helping North Korea economically, diplomatically, North Korea have had uncomfortable mind towards China. Considering these historical experiences, China-North Korea relations should not be seen as a complete dependency. China factor is certainly an important aspect of North Korea's foreign policy decision-making process, but not the most important factor. Thank you very much. Thank you, KLJ. We're Almost out of time, but I want to see if there are just a couple of questions, um, some Q's, Q and A's. Uh, any questions, comments? Mark Moore with the Asia program. I just have one quick comment. Please, uh, please wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one quick comment, and that's um, based on your publications and uh, really a follow-up to Professor Yu's comment about the China factor. Uh, and it's p published by, you, you know it very well because I, I learned it by reading your publication, uh, Chen Zhen from the Chinese documents that uh, Kim Il-sung may have tried adventurism in the late 60s and then when it failed uh, went to uh, traditional United Front tactics. But by April 1975, he decided it was a good idea to invade South Korea and he went to uh, Mao Zedong for, uh, and this is all documented and published, but when I read it, it's just fantastic. He uh, asked, uh, again, because 1975 it was the end of the Cultural Revolution and China was occupied in its own internal affairs. And the idea of uh, helping North Korea in a war against the United States was preposterous, but Kim Il-sung uh, didn't see that at all, and he proposed that with the United States uh, 
withdrawing in Vietnam, now was the perfect time to invade. Mao referred him to Deng Xiaoping saying, oh, this is international affairs and I'm not doing it anymore, please see Deng. And Deng said it was, Bu Fangbian, it was inconvenient at the time because they were engaged in socialist reconstruction. But I would uh, advise everyone to take a look at that uh, publication. And I'm sure Christian can make it available, but it's really, you know, uh, adventurism and then United Front and then, uh, what the heck, it's all failed, let's just attack. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any comments? Anybody else? You? Anybody else? Any other questions or comments? Yep. Uh, my, oh, uh, my name is Stephen Shore. I always thought it would be very useful to have a definitive study as to the differences between Vietnam and Korea. Uh, I, I, I know of no such work, and I think the Wilson Center would be an ideal venue to have one produced. But my question, if I can having planted this seed, hopefully, in people's minds who are qualified to carry it out. My question is, why did efforts to establish the equivalent of the NLF in South Korea fail when there was a sizable group, if never a majority, of South Vietnamese who wanted unification with the North? Why did such a, even under the most repressive years of the South Korean government, what was no such movement of any sizable, of any size developed. Thank you. Young or Kelsey? This very interesting question, and uh, nobody knows exactly why. But one thing is very clear: uh, when North Korea first uh, communized the North Korean, uh, North Korean government allowed many possible. Uh, uh, defectors or possible uh, resistance to flee to South Korea. Basically, many p people who fled from North to South Korea was the uh, landlords or capitalists or intelligence. And they fled from North Korea voluntarily. And during the Korean War, that happens again. And uh, during the Park Jung era, it was Great economic success made many people just uh, comply to South Korean government. Uh, in a sense, this uh, word was correct that efficiency made some sort of legitimacy for the South Korean government. Because of that, many people, uh, many intelligence uh, had some hatred against that uh, repressive regime. At the same time, many people uh, believe that economic success uh, is uh, very useful. Uh, there could be one, one answer, but nobody can say it definitely. Yeah. Anybody else like to respond? Well, good. Well, let me uh, then bring this meeting, since we're over time already, to a conclusion. Uh, thank our panelists for, for stimulating um, uh, presentations. Let me add bad wishes, uh, best wishes for <laughs> Miryang Yoon for you. <laughs> uh, as she heads back to Seoul um, and point you to